unit comprises of the various testing equipments and tests which are required in the fabric and garment industry and how to do the product care. The unit comprises of two modules. The first module is on textile testing and product evaluation. Module 2 is on care labels and the product care. Unit objectives are by the end of this unit the students will be able to list the objectives of testing and product evaluation, list the objectives of care labels, review their importance,
fabric strength fabric strength can be divided into three areas breaking strength that is the resistance to tensile force tear strength resistance to tearing or shearing force bursting strength resistant resistance to bursting force breaking strength we will talk about breaking strength first breaking strength it is used for woven fabrics it can be measured length or width or both a specimen of 15 cm by 10 cm is placed between two sets of jaws 7.6 cm apart jaws are then pulled away from each other creating a tensile force on the fabric specimen ultimately resulting a break in the fabric specimen Metric strength tester, and uh, I can break some fabric on this for you now. And we'll determine the strength and the elongation of this strip of fabric. Normally, we would cut this fabric wider than 50 millimeters and fray it down to 50 millimeters. But this is a coated fabric or a laminated fabric. So we're just stuck with the less accurate method of cutting as accurately as we can to 50 millimetres wide. So that's the sample in there. Just as I put the sample in there, I pulled down gently on the lower end of the sample to give us a slight pretension. That just makes sure that the extension is an accurate figure. And now I'm going to start the test by pressing strain and peak hold and peak hold will freeze the maximum force of the sample, which will be the force at break. Put my finger by this stop button here, and when the fabric sample breaks, I'll stop the test. At 60 kilograms for 70, it should break about 100. There we go. That's the test done. Um, that broke at a, a force of 88 kilograms force with an extension of 58 millimeters. Press the return button. That brings the crosshead back down. And then we can remove the sample. And the sample here is a Gore-Tex, a three-layer Gore-Tex laminate. And on that we've got a, a knitted backing. We've got the woven front, the outer layer of the, uh, the fabric, which would be the outer layer of a jacket. And in between, this white layer you can see is a PTFE layer. This is Gore-Tex, as it were. And that's how I test done. On a British standard test, we'd repeat that five times in the warp direction and five times in the weft direction to get the warp and weft strength of the fabric.
tearing strength tearing strength is tested by the instrument almendorf it refers to its resistance to tearing or shearing force it is used for shirting military fabrics such as parachutes it is not suitable for knit fabrics felts or non woven fabric with exceptions right this is the uh, the tear strength test again we use the testometric uh, testing machine um, but we have this rather funny shaped sample with a deep cut up the middle of the sample and we mark on that two lines they're going to tell us where to put the sample in the jaws of the machine and basically we are going to tear from this point the top of the cut in the fabric along the fabric to the dot which is 25 millimeters from the square end of the fabric so I'm going to mount this on the machine now that up through there and then align up this line with the bottom of the top jar and close it and this line with the top of the bottom jar and close it up. Now as you can see there the sample is fairly skew width in there so the extension isn't telling us anything so we ignore it on this, it's not in a straight line, it's not meaningful. And all we're interested in is the peak of the force as we tear the fabric along the sample. So as soon as the sample is in the jaws, we can start the test, I'll press the drain, start the test. And then we wait for tension to arrive at the top of the cut, and for one, two thread breaks in the fabric and then put on peak hold. We ignore the first two thread breaks of the fabric because they typically take a higher force than the others to break and will give you a false high reading for your fabric. So you can hear the thread, the individual yarns breaking now as we rip along the fabric and then when we get to the dot We stop the test. Because I put peak hold on, that has frozen the maximum force as it tore along that line, and we've got 4.8 kilograms force, just short of 5 kilograms force there. We've finished that test now once we've recorded that, and I just press turn, return to bring the crosshead back down take the sample out and then we're ready for the next sample. Again you'd have five samples in one direction, five samples in another. Bursting strength. Bursting test is done for knitted fabrics, lightweight woven fabrics and the non-woven fabrics. It is the force uniformly distributed over a given area needed to break a fabric when applied at right angles to the fabrics. Hello friends, the determination of the bursting resistance and bursting surface tension. The bursting resistance and bursting surface tension are determined by applying pressure on the bottom of the sample placed on the diaphragm. Two methods called hydraulic and pneumatic are used for this purpose. The device is comprised of two parts, which are the automatic bursting device and the sample test area. Test areas can be 100 square centimeters, 50 square centimeters, 10 square centimeters, or 7.3 square centimeters according to the characteristics of the sample. The test sample is marked according to the area we will use. We condition the test sample under standard atmospheric conditions for 24 hours. We lay the conditioned sample on a flat surface. When taking 
the specimen five sets of samples of 140 millimeters by 140 millimeters must be cut at least 150 millimeters from the inside of the specimen. Samples can be taken without being cut because of the clutch system in the device. The area we will use now is of 7.3 square centimeters and a size of 140 millimeter sample is appropriate. When the sample is taken, it must contain different strands of the warp and weft. It is taken from areas that are not wrinkled. If the specimen is to be tested when they are wet, they are kept in a special water at 20 degrees centigrade for one hour. When the samples are dried with blotting paper, we cut off the edges of the prepared sample. Prepared samples are inserted into the bursting device and are tested. We put five pieces of specimen, which we have prepared as 140 mm by 140 mm in accordance with the experiment area, into the device to burst them. We must make sure that the sample is not tight when placing it in the device. We pay attention to the fact that the bottom tray of 7.3 square centimeters clutching device in the testing area is in the same area. By pressing two buttons at the top of the device, we make it clutch the sample between two plates. Then we control the device with the computer. Pressing the OK button, we start the device. The diaphragm is swelling with the air from below with glycerol and this explosion should take place at 20 plus or minus 5 seconds. We use a hydraulic device in this test. When the explosion takes place in the sample, we can see the speed, duration, the mass of the sample and severity of the explosion on the screen. Five samples are tested in this way and the arithmetic mean is estimated. The test result of samples that do not burst at 20 plus or minus 5 seconds is not acceptable. Then. The bursting resistance is calculated by subjecting the diaphragm to the same process alone and subtracting diaphragm pressure from the arithmetic mean of the sample. Seam strength is tested by the instrument Instron. Seam failure in a garment can occur because of either failure of sewing thread, leaving the fabric intact or fabric rupture leaving the fabric seam intact or both breaking at the same time.
Now the elements affecting the seam strength are the stitch type, SPI, stitches per inch, thread tension, seam type, seam efficiency, elasticity, seam slippage and seam cracking. Resistance to yard slippage. This test method is used to determine the resistance to slippage of filling yarns over warp yarns or warp yarns over filling yarns using a standard seam. It is used as an indication of the tendency of yarns to slip at a seam when stress is applied. The result is that the yarns pull out but the thread and the stitch does not rupture. Seam slippage is usually caused by poor fabric design, too loose of a weave or too narrow of a seam margin. Not using enough stitches per inch and a poor stitch balance can also contribute to seam slippage. This is ASTMD 1683 seam strength test. We will cut the fabric from a sample with seam. Uh, we will make the seam if the sample is fabric. In the same way, the equipment will pull the fabric from two directions and uh, the sensor will record the maximum broken strength of the seam. Fabric stretch properties. Stretch is required in all apparel products, more in sportswear and swimwear. Stretch requirement are more at across shoulder, neck rib, hip, knee and elbow. Dimensional changes in apparel is due to laundering, dry cleaning and pressing. Shrinkage due to fiber, yarn, and fabric shrinkage, pre-shrunk by sanfrizing, a fabric specimen marked 10 inches by 10 inches or maximum 1 meter by 1 meter in both length and width with indelible ink is washed or dry cleaned and conditioned. The distance is again calculated and the shrinkage percentage is calculated. Based on the requirement, progressive shrinkage can also be calculated for 3 or 4 washes. The apparatus and materials we will use in this test are anti-front loading washing machine, load balancing fabric, dimensional change template of 50 cm by 50 cm size, hard ink pen for marking. Detergents that will be used for washing consist of three groups. 70% of them are EC reference detergent without phosphate, 20% of them are sodium perperate, and 3% of them are tetraacetyl ethylene diamine. An 8.11 gram detergent mixture is prepared to form a 3 cm foam in the washing process. Test samples are conditioned at the conditioning environment for at least 24 hours before the test. The dimensional change template is placed on the fabric. 
A mark is made in the warp direction of the fabric. Our templates are placed according to this point. After making sure that the warp and weft directions are regular, we mark the pattern between the marked pairs, which are marked with an ink pen. The distance between the marked pairs is 350 millimeters. Each point is prepared with marking. The drawing is done again to identify the location of the cutting on the edge of the template. The marked parts are cut. The test sample is sewn on four edges of the sample with the overlock sewing machine to avoid unstitching before we put the sample inside the washing machine. We use three different detergents to obtain detergent mixture that will be used at the dimensional change test in washing and drying. 77% of 11.8 grams mixed detergent solution are ECE detergent and its weight is 9.09 .09 grams. After reading the value on the screen, we put it into a beaker. Then, 20% of the portion of the sodium perperate detergent, which is 2.36 grams, is weighed with scales. This weighed detergent, 2.36 grams, is added to the ECE detergent 9.09 .09 grams. Then we add tap water and a fish magnet to the detergent and using the magnet mixer we make it reach the 40 degrees centigrade. After the detergent has reached 40 degrees centigrade we cool it to a lower temperature that is 30 degrees centigrade. Before adding the detergent to the machine, 3% 0.354 grams of the tetraacetylene diamine, known as bleaching detergent, is weighed. The detergent we weighed is added to the solution that is cooled down to 30 degrees centigrade and it is made ready for the washing operation. The test sample that we have prepared for the dimensional change is placed in automatic washing machines. Before the placement, the weight is reset on the scales. The load balance of fabrics that are put with the test sample are completed at 2 kilograms. The device lid is closed. 
After the 2 kilogram value is read on the screen, the washing program is selected from the washing list of the machine. After selecting the desired washing program, the start button is pushed and the washing process begins. I add the detergent mixture that is previously prepared onto the top. After the washing process has finished, the test sample is dried by required drying methods. There are five different drying methods. Hanger drying, hanger drying along a straight line, even drying, even pressed iron drying, and drum drying. The test sample is dried by applying one of these drying processes. After washing and drying, the test samples are conditioned in standard atmospheric conditions. A dimensional change ruler is used to measure the percentage change of the test sample. The zero point of this ruler is placed at the point that we measure. The distance between one edge to the other is measured. To measure the amount of shrinkage and elongation of the test samples, the zero point of the ruler is put at one of the marked points. Measuring the place of the 350 mm marked point on the shrinkage scale, we record it. In this way, the measurements of three points on the test sample are taken. If the test sample has shrunk or been extended, we give this as a result of the test. If there is an extension, the result is given as positive. If there is a shrinkage, the result is given as negative. Durable press is the term used to describe fabric or garments that will retain its original shape, smoothness and sharpness of crease through wear and repeated laundering and which do not require ironing. The fabric or garment is washed three to five times and then stored at standard atmospheric condition for two hours and then compared with a scale of one to five. Bow and squeeze, filling yarn in woven and coarse in knitted are perpendicular to the selvage. In case there is a deviation, bow and skewness is noticed as per the deviation. Bow and skewness can be induced during cloth manufacturing, dyeing, stantering, finishing or other operations where a potential exists for the uneven distribution of tension across the fabric width. It is more prominent in color pattern and small pattern. Garment twisting, no standard value for bow, arc and screw. Both are exp expressed in percentages. So here we see that uh, the skewness we see in the image is given. Pilling. It's a surface defect characterized by little fiber balls clinging to cloth surface and giving a garment unsightly appearance. Such balls or pills are evident on the areas of garment where some abrasion takes place during normal wear such as collar, cuff, side and back pockets of trousers and so on. Fibers such as wool, polyester, nylon and acrylic have a tendency to pill. Pilling depends on the fiber length, denier, fiber mechanical properties, yarn twist level, fabric construction, fabric finishing treatment and end use of the apparel. The equipment used for pilling test is Martindale tester. ASTM has developed three sets of five photographic standards, each set corresponding 
to the size of pills produced small medium and large compared to scale 1 is to 5 The determination of the sample break in abrasion resistance fabrics with the Martindale method. The number of cycles until the sample breaks as a result of the abrasion resistance of fabric is determined. To do this, we will use the Martindale abrasion and pilling tester, a 38mm sample cutter and a 140mm wide abrasive cloth cutter, a sample holder, load cells, Martindale abrasive device to place the presser foot and the apparatus that weighs 2.5 kilograms. First, the test specimen is conditioned under a minimum of 24 hours of standard atmospheric conditions. We spread the conditioned test sample on a flat surface. We take a 38 millimeter sample from the spread specimen. While taking the sample, it is taken in a way that it includes each pattern in patterned fabrics. Areas that are not wrinkled are cut 3 cm from the inside. Sponge foam is not used when the mass of specimen is 500 grams per square meter. Foam sponge is used only for samples under 500 grams per square meter. 100% standard wool sample is cut as abrasive fabric for 38 millimeter wide samples.
140 mm felt is placed before the fabric we cut on the table. The samples that are cut are placed in the sample holder to start the test. Thirty-eight millimeter wide samples are attached to the sample holder. For this, the collar of the sample holder is removed from its slot. The sample in the Martindale abrasion and pilling tester on the table is attached to the holder. The sample is placed into the collar in a way that its front side faces the front side, that is downwards. If the sample is lighter than 500 grams per square meter, foam is inserted. The foam is also cut as 38 millimeters. The device is placed on the foam and the sample holder is compressed. In this way, three pieces of 38 mm diameter samples are firmly placed in the sample holder. The samples are placed in the abrasing device. First, the Lucy Goy's pattern of abrasion device is checked. For this, a sample of 140 mm wide and A4 sheet are cut. The sample we have cut is inserted into its slot on the abrasing table and the collar is squeezed. The balls of the device are removed from the pilling slots and are placed in the abrasing slots. These balls allow the sample holder manual to move properly. The balls are moved towards the center. The manual is placed in the slot. The Lucy Goy's pattern is composed of 16 rubbing movements and the number of abrasion rubbing is entered to the device as 16. A pencil is placed in the sample holder of the table, which we will check. We begin to check by pressing the start button. After the device has stopped, the pencil is removed from the slot and the pattern is checked. This process is repeated separately for each table. To do this, pattern ranges are checked. When pattern intervals are equal, we accept that the device is suitable. Then we put the abrasive sample to prepare 
the abrasive table. For this, we put down 140 millimeters of weft. We put 100% wool abrasive fabric inside the felt that we have placed. When placing the sample, we make sure that the thread direction is parallel to the table. Putting the presser foot on the abrasive cloth, we attach it to the table with squeezing collars. Removing the 2.5 kilogram presser foot from the abrasive fabric, we insert the sample manual. Then, we place the samples on the tables with the same numbers in accordance with the number on the sample holder. We attach it to the table with the compression apparatus. Checking the number of the second sample, we place it on the abrasive table as well. If the sample is technically used, specimens such as upholstery or bed linen, we place a weight of 12 kilopascals on it. Except for household textiles such as upholstery and bed linen, we place a weight of 9 kilopascals. The sample we are currently testing is garment fabric and we are putting a weight of 9 kilo pascals. A total weight of 595 kilograms is applied. Then we enter the number of rubbing abrasion. Resetting the value on the screen, we check the sample every 1000 cycles of the total rubbing abrasion number is 5000. 2000 cycles if it is between 5000 to 20,000 RPM. It is checked every 5,000 cycles if it is between 20,000 to 40,000. If it is higher than 40,000, it is checked every 10,000 cycles. In case of abrasion, these intervals can be more frequent. To do this, we initially enter 2,000 RPM and press the start button. We will check the samples at certain intervals. At the end of 2000 cycles, the device will automatically stop. We use an 8 times magnifying glass or loop to check the brakes. And when there are two different weft or warp yarn brakes, we end the test. If there is no abrasion when we check it, we enter 2000 RPM again and go on to the abrasive friction. We stop the test after the sample breaks. ATCC has developed three scales that help a visual comparison between the original color and color change and staining of the test specimen. These scales are gray scales for color change and staining and chromatic transference scales. AATCC gray scales, gray scale for color change, gray scale for staining, chromatic transference scale. Gray scale for color change, this scale consists of 9 pairs of standard gray chips each pair representing a difference in color or contrast corresponding to numerical fastness rating. Test results are rated by 
visually comparing the difference in color represented by the scale. Assessment of color fastness and staining. The assessment is done using gray scales by visually comparing the difference in color or contrast between the untreated and treated specimens with the differences represented by the scale. Visually comparing the difference in color or the contrast between the stained and unstained adjacent fabrics with the differences represented by the scale. Gray scale for staining. This scale consists of pairs of nominally white and gray color chips, each representing a difference in color or contrast corresponding to a numerical rating for staining. A swatch of the unstained fabrics and the tested piece of it are placed side by side in the same plane and oriented in the same direction. The visual difference between the original unstained and tested stained pieces is compared with the difference represented by the gray scale which corresponds to the contrast between the original and tested specimen. Rating from 1 is to 5 where 5 means no difference in color between the original material and the tested piece of it. Chromatic transference scale. This scale makes use of 30 color chips. The neutral chip representing the horizontal number 5 as well as neutral gray chips were selected to correspond to the gray chips of all the steps on the gray scale for staining. The rows are placed and aligned so that every color shows a similar graduation in depth in a vertical line ranging from the lightest tint on top to the heaviest tints on the bottom. The fabric exhibiting the transferred color to be evaluated is placed behind the card on which the chips are mounted so that a representative part of the colored portion is visible through one of the circular holes in the vertical column closest to it in character of shade. The standard undyed fabrics used in the color fastness testing are multifiber and 100% cotton. Multifiber fabric to check staining on other fiber types multifiber adjacent fabric is being used. It is made of yarns of various generic kinds of fibers, each of which forms a strip of specified width providing even thickness of the fabric. Cotton fabrics. This fabric is used for evaluating color transfer in crocking, rubbing and hot pressing. It is made of de-sized and bleached 80 by 80 100% cotton print cloth. Color fastness. We have color fastness to washing, color fastness to dry cleaning, color fastness to light, color fastness to crocking, color fastness to perspiration, color fastness to abrasion, color fastness to heat and color fastness to ozone. Color fastness to washing. The instrument used in this test method is called laundrometer. A piece of multi-fiber fabric is attached to a test specimen of the size 5 by 10 cm. This specimen is then put in a steel jar filled with soap solution and several tiny steel balls. These jars are then rotated for 45 minutes to create agitation action. Then the specimen are removed from the jars, rinsed under running water and allowed to dry. Then the staining of the multi-fiber fabric is rated using either the gray scale for straining or chromatic transference scales and the change in the original color or shade of the specimen is rated using gray scale for color change. 
the rating should not be worse than class 3 or 4. Hello friends, the purpose of this test is to determine the color change of any kind of printed and dyed textile product as a result of exposure to water for a short or long period of time and the stain it makes on the adjacent fabric. In this test we use the perspirometer device. Also a 5 kilogram weight must be put on the device so as to provide a pressure of 2.5 kilopascals. The multi-fiber adjacent fabric or single fiber adjacent fabric can be used as the adjacent fabric. We will use the multi-fiber adjacent fabric today. We use the acrylic resin plates in order to place our samples on the device. As the test is about color fastness against water, we use distilled water. We can use a template to prepare the sample or we can cut the fabric in sizes of 10 cm by 4 cm with a ruler. If there is a possibility to confuse the front and reverse sides of the sample, we can mark the reverse side of the sample to prevent the confusion. I can sew the prepared sample with the adjacent fabric facing each other. As you see, my adjacent fabric is in roll form. I'm cutting this in the same width with the sample. I am sewing along the short side in a way that the adjacent fabric and the test sample are facing each other. If the seams are loose, it will be easier to remove the sample from the adjacent fabric at the end of the test. In this way, I have prepared the sample. If the sample is fiber or yarn and not a fabric, the amount of fiber or yarn that is used must be half of that of the adjacent fabric weight. The sample is prepared by sewing the adjacent fabric to the one side of the sample and the non-diable polypropylene fabric to the other side. I put the sample that was prepared for the color fastness against water into a container with a flat surface. I'm adding water until the surface is covered. The amount of distilled water exceeds a little bit more than 100 milliliters, but there is no determined amount of solution for this test. However, 
If the fabric is thicker, more solution may be used in order to cover the sample surface. I'm mixing the solution with a glass rod well enough to ensure the penetration into the sample. Then I keep the sample in the solution to ensure the absorption. When I'm sure that the solution is absorbed into the sample very well, I remove the sample. And now I'm pouring the excess solution on a plate. Then, the sample is placed between acrylic resin plates and we put the sample into persiprometer. I place the sample horizontally in the middle of the device. I place the lower apparatus. After placing the top apparatus, I put the weight creating a pressure of 2.5 kilopascals and I squeeze the screws. In this way, the excess of water is filtered and then the sample is put in the drying oven that has been preheated at 37 degrees centigrade for four hours. The sample is placed vertically into the oven previously adjusted to 37 degrees centigrade. The oven must be closed quickly to prevent the temperature fall. And then we wait for four hours. The sample is removed from the oven after four hours. I remove the sample from the oven and the oven is adjusted not to exceed 60 degrees centigrade. I hang the sample along the short edge. After the sample has dried, the test is finished to determine the staining and the discoloration. Color fastness to dry cleaning. This test method is done in the same way as color fastness to washing, except that instead of using soap solution, dry cleaning solution, perchloroethylene is used. A color unaffected by perchloroethylene will not be affected by petroleum solvents, whereas the converse is not always true. Perchloroethylene is used in this test because it is as extensively used as the standard solvent in commercial dry cleaning in the United States and if it is necessary to evaluate the effect of water spotting, solvent spotting and stream pressing which are normally associated with commercial dry cleaning then it is best to send the fabric or garment for one or more repeated dry cleaning. Then evaluate this sample compared to the original non-dry cleaned sample. ...and materials which will be used in this test are the color fastness test device, stainless steel discs, a stainless steel tube, perchloroethylene solution and cotton twill fabric. The gray scale is used to evaluate the colors fading and colors running. The test samples are conditioned for a certain period of time to prepare the test samples. And then 
The test samples required for testing are prepared in the size of 4 cm by 10 cm. Our template is located on any part of the fabric and then it is marked as 4 cm by 10 cm in size and the marked sections are cut. Two pieces of cotton twill fabric are cut two as 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters in size to sew a bag. Then they are cut properly from marked sections. The samples which we cut are sewn on three selvages. Then the test sample and 12 pieces of steel discs are placed to create a bag. The section is opened and closed and then tested. Two hundred milliliters of perchlorothalene solution that we will use is measured to be used for color fastness against dry cleaning. Then it is heated in the heater at 30 degrees centigrade after it is put into the beaker. The test sample and perchlorothalene solution are put into the stainless steel tube. 30 degrees centigrade perchlorothalene is applied to the sample. The lid of the tube is closed. The perchlorothalene solution, which was previously heated at 30 degrees centigrade, is put into the test device. The lid of the device is closed and the start button is pressed. The test specimen is processed for 30 minutes on the test device. The bag is removed from the tube. The perchlorothalene solution is filtered. The sample is taken from the bag. The test sample is dried at 60 degrees centigrade in the oven. The solution that remains in the tube is transferred to 25 mm glass tubes by being filtered through the filtering paper. Color fastness to light. The test instrument used in the color fastness of light test is called the fadeometer and or vedrometer. 
the instrument uses as a light store source either a carbon or xenon arc lamp artificial light source consistent and speedy results but light source should stimulate the effect of the natural sunlight carbon arc is stronger in the ultraviolet region and would be expected to produce a greater effect on colored textiles whereas xenon arc exposure generally correlates more closely with sunlight time and intensity the resistance to degradation of fabric dyes and prints due to light is an important requirement of a garment the assessment of fastness to light necessitates the use of reference standard whether exposure are made in actual sunlight or by accelerated means of utilizing artificial light source reference standard blue wool standards Test specimens are exposed to a standard light source with a wavelength similar to sunlight. The degree of fading under these conditions is assessed against a standard set of blue dyed samples numbered 1 to 8. Several types of machine are available but all use the standard xenon light source. A specimen is cut from the sample using two 45 by 10 mm strips to ensure that all the colours in the sample are tested. The test specimen is mounted onto a special white card. The complete card is mounted into the specimen holders with an area of the test specimen covered by a metal mask. A similar card is prepared using similar size strips of the blue dyed standards. The number used varies according to the performance standard required. Cards are mounted on each side of the holder. The conditions of temperature and humidity inside the test chamber are set. The specimen holders are mounted on the rotating table until all positions are filled. The holders rotate around the central light source. For every revolution of the table, the holders rotate through 180 degrees. The door is closed and the light source switched on and left until the blue dyed sample relevant to the performance standard has reached the required shape change. Specimens are examined, the exposed to unexposed areas are compared and graded against the blue standards using a standard light source and viewing cabinet. Color fastness to crocking. A colored test specimen fastened to the base of a crock meter is rubbed with a white test cloth and assessed by comparison with the AATCC chromatic transference scale or gray scale for staining. Color fastness to crocking. Wet and dry, both color fastness to crocking are tested.
Color fastness to perspiration. A specimen of color textile 6 by 6 cm is wet with a stimulated perspiration solution subjected to a fixed mechanical pressure in contact with a piece of multi-fiber test fabric also wet with the simulated perspiration solution and allowed to dry slowly at a slightly elevated temperature for 6 hours. Test specimen is evaluated for color change and staining on the multi-fiber test fabric with the help of the AATCC gray scale. Color fastness to perspiration test specimen is evaluated for color change and staining on the multi-fiber test fabric with the help of the AATCC gray scale.
Hello friends. As you know, clothes are influenced by body sweat and sometimes fade, and sweat sometimes stains light-colored clothes. The purpose of this test is to determine the color change of printed and dyed textile products when they are exposed to the body sweat and the stain on the adjacent fabric as well. The perspirometer is the first of the devices that will be used in this test. The device is used for acidic and alkaline samples. The samples are subjected to testing in these devices. Besides this, we need a stove that can be adjusted to 37 degrees centigrade. The samples are placed between the acrylic resin plates in the device. Some multi-fiber adjacent fabric or single fiber adjacent fabric can be used as adjacent fabric. Today, we will use some multi-fiber adjacent fabric. In addition, the acidic and alkaline sweat solutions must be prepared. The pH value of acidic and alkaline sweat solutions must be adjusted to 5.5 and 8 respectively. The acidic sweat solution is composed of sodium chloride, histidine and sodium dehydrogen phosphate. On the other hand, the alkaline sweat solution is composed of sodium chloride, histidine and disodium hydrogen phosphate. Calibrations on pH values of acidic and alkaline solutions are made by sodium hydroxide. In the process of the sample preparation, one acidic and one alkaline sample are prepared. We can use a template to prepare samples or we can cut the fabric in sizes of 10 cm by 4 cm with a ruler. In the same way, we prepare an adjacent fabric with the same size. Our adjacent fabric is in roll form. We later make them the same size by cutting 4 cm along the width. If there is a possibility to confuse the front and reverse sides of the sample, we can mark the reverse side of the sample to avoid confusion. We are sewing along the short side in a way that the adjacent fabric and the sample face each other. I'm trying to sew it in a way that they are not very tight because I want to unstitch it easily at the end of the test. In this way, I have prepared the sample. I follow the same procedure for my alkaline sample. After preparing the acidic and alkaline test solutions, the sample is exposed to these solutions. If the sample is made of fiber or yarn, as much fiber or yarn as half of adjacent fabric's weight is used. The sample is prepared by sewing the adjacent fabric to one side of the sample and the undyable polypropylene fabric to the other side. Then, I have prepared the sample by sewing it along all four sides.
Samples are weighed before the test and their original weight is recorded. The purpose of this is to make sure that the samples absorb as much solution as 2 or 2.5 times of their weight. We write down the value. We prepare one acidic and one alkaline sample. We multiply the values we have found by 50 and so we find the amount of solution that we will add. That is, 50 times of the value are taken and that amount of sweat solution is added for this sample. After our test samples have been prepared, we prepare acidic and alkaline solutions. For this, I first begin with the acidic solution. First, we weigh 5 grams of sodium chloride. We should make sure that the chemicals that we use have analytical purity. In the weighing process, we go on by reducing the added amount as we get close to the value of 5 grams. I never put back into the box the excess of the amount taken from the box. The cloth need not be so sensitive. 5.022 grams are quite an ideal value, but it is important that it is not under 5 grams. Then I put the amount that I weighed into the beaker. Then, I weigh histidine, which is a kind of amino acid in the second step. The solution we prepared is made of human sweat, and human sweat consists of proteins and amino acids coming from food that we have. So we use amino acids in the sweat solution. We weigh 0.5 grams of histidine. I don't put back the excess amount into the box. Then I put it into the beaker. I shake the rest with distilled water at the bottom of the beaker to avoid substance loss. Then I weigh 2.2 grams of sodium dehydrogen, which is our acidic composition. Again, I eliminate the excessive amount. I add acidic composition that I have weighed into the mixture. I shake it with distilled water clockwise.
In this way, the acidic sweat solution is prepared. Then I add a little pure water. The more pure water I add, the easier the decomposition will be. Therefore, I shake it fast. I smash big particles so that they dissolve more easily. Because, as you know, when the particles get smaller, the decomposition rate rises. In this way, the compounds are fully decomposed. I have prepared the acidic sweat solution. The next step is to transfer this to a balloon. While we transfer the solution into the balloon, the use of a rod in this way will keep the solution flowing directly into the balloon, not to anywhere else. I put some amount of pure water into the beaker. I shake the beaker and then I pour the water into the balloon. After having shaken the solution, I can pour it into the balloon without using a rod. we complete the solution in the balloon to one liter. Because I must adjust the solution's pH value to 5.5, I will do this adjustment with sodium hydroxide and therefore I leave a little space in it. Then I shake the solution. In this way, the acidic solution is prepared. Now, I weigh 5 grams of sodium chloride to prepare the alkaline sweat solution. Then I put it into the beaker. I weigh 0.5 grams of histidine. I shake to clean the dust in the glass. Then I weigh 2.5 grams of disodium hydrogen phosphate. We add the solution into this.
we add distilled water again. The alkaline sweat solution dissolves harder than the acidic one. Because the particle dimension of the alkaline solution is bigger, we mix the composition hard again and smash the big particles to provide an easier decomposition. So now we have prepared the alkaline sweat solution by shaking it hard and there is no unsolved substance in it. Then we transfer it into the balloon as we did for the acidic solution. We pour it with a rod. We shake the beaker's bottom with some distilled water. We complete the solution up to one liter again. The alkaline solution's pH value must be 8, so I leave a little space in it. I close the plug and shake it well enough to mix. In this way, I have prepared the acidic and alkaline sweat solutions. Then, the samples are exposed to this solution. We will set the pH values of the acidic and alkaline samples. Firstly, we set the acidic solution's pH value to 5.5. I'll use the 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide solution to adjust the pH. I clean the tip of my pH meter's electrode. I dip it into the solution and after observing the pH value, I take some sodium hydroxide solution with a pipette and a pouir. After adding it, I shake it immediately and measure the pH value again. If I add a little more, it's going to be enough, since I have observed a value very close to the desired pH value. I add a few drops and then, shaking again, I dip the electrode into the same solution without washing it. I'm waiting for the pH value to be fixed at 5.5 on the screen. As soon as I see that it is fixed, I remove the electrode. Then I complete the solution to 1000 milliliters. Here, the line on the balloon's rim helps me. The lower surface of the liquid is adjusted according to the line, since it is a colorless liquid. I'm shaking it for the last time and the preparation process of the acidic solution has been completed. Now, I will set the alkaline solution's pH value to 8. 
I clean the tip of my pH meter's electrode and dip it into the solution to see the pH value. After observing the pH value, I continue the process with sodium hydroxide. I'm shaking it. When I see that the pH value is adjusted, I remove the electrode. I complete the solution up to 1000 milliliters. In the same way, the line on the balloon guides me. I shake it again and in this way the alkaline solution has been prepared. Now the next step is to subject the test samples to the acidic and alkaline sweat solutions. For this I use plates with a flat surface. One is used for acidic and the other one is used for alkaline samples. Since I weighed the acidic and alkaline samples when they were dry. I multiply the weighing results by 50 and I add as much solution to them. Since we calculated this value before, we can now directly add it. Now we are adding our alkaline solution. I press on the samples with a glass rod so that the solution may penetrate into the samples well enough. Then I keep them waiting in the sweat solution for half an hour. While waiting, I stir it up like this now and again. After the waiting time is over, I remove the samples from the solution. I pour the excessive amount of solution by means of a glass rod. I weighed the samples when they were dry. Now I weigh them as being wet. I make sure that they have absorbed as much solution as 2 to 2.5 times of their original weight. After observing that they are at the desired value, I can place my sample into the device. We can Place both of them together after doing the same for the alkaline sample. Yes. 
I place the test samples into the perspirometer device. Firstly, I open the upper part. I place the sample between two acrylic plates. I can place 10 samples to be tested at once, so I can use more acrylic plates. This is an optional situation, and I place my sample with 10 acrylic plates. I center the acrylic plates in the middle of the surface. I make the edges flat, and then I put this piece over it. After that, I place the top bracket and put the weight that creates a pressure of 12.5 kPa. I squeeze the screws. In this way, I filter the excess solution and my acidic solution has been placed into the device. After doing the same for the alkaline sample, I put my samples into the oven that was preheated to 37 degrees centigrade and wait for four hours. The acidic and alkaline samples are placed vertically into the previously adjusted oven to 37 degrees in temperature. Then we wait for four hours. The sample is removed from the oven after four hours. After taking the sample out of the device, I set the oven to a temperature that will not exceed 60 degrees centigrade. I put the sample into the oven and hang it alongside its short edge. After the sample is dried, the test is finalized to determine the staining and the discoloration. The second step of evaluation is the level of fading in color. For this step, the original sample is placed on the left side and the tested sample is placed on the right side and the difference is analyzed by using a mask. The difference between them is determined with the color fading scale. The values on the scale are 1 to 5. Here, 1 is the worst, whereas 5 is the best value. The test result is obtained by comparing the difference between the sample and the original with the scale. Color fastness to abrasion. Frosting is a change of color in a fabric caused by localized abrasive wear. It may be the result of referential wear as in multi-component blends in which the fibers do not match in shade or of the abrasion of single fiber construction in which there is variation in or incomplete penetration of dye stuff.
colorfastness to heat hot pressing the test method is intended for determining the resistance of color of textiles of all kinds and in all forms to color change and color transfer when subjected to hot pressing tests are given for hot pressing when a fabric is dry damp and wet the textile and use usually determines which tests are to be conducted many dispersed dyes since they have no strong iron or ionic group exhibit a significant vapor pressure and when exposed to sufficient heat will go from solid to a gas without passing through a liquid phase if a fabric dyed with dispersed dye is exposed to high temperature the dye may sublime and the dye vapor may be absorbed by adjacent fibers the test method is intended for determining the resistance of color of textiles of all kinds and in all forms to color change and color transfer when subjected to hot pressing tests are given for hot pressing when a fabric is dry damp and wet the textile end use usually determine which test should be conducted the color fastness against hot pressing is the determination of resistance of all types and all kinds of textile materials colors to ironing and meanwhile to processing on hot cylinders in this test we use a press ironing machine which can apply 4 kPa plus minus 1 kPa pressure a heat resistant layer wool flannel fabric with a mass of 260 grams per square meter per unit cotton fabric with a mass area ranging between 100 and 130 grams per square meters per unit cotton adjacent fabric with dimensions of 100 mm by 40 mm a stopwatch pure water and a precision balance the samples should be conditioned under standard atmospheric conditions for 24 hours then the conditioned test samples are laid out on a flat surface and the sample is prepared while the sample is prepared it must not be too close to the edge of the fabric samples also the samples should not be taken from the fold marks and wrinkled areas of the fabric We can do the test in three ways: dry, damp, and wet. While we take the sample, we make use of a template with a dimension of 40 mm by 100 mm. The test samples which we have prepared are cut properly with scissors. We test dry, damp and wet samples with the hot pressing device. First of all, we set the pressing temperature of the device to 150 degrees centigrade. Then, we place the heat resistant plate to the lower layer of the device. We place the filling material which is made of wool flannel on it and we place the cotton fabric on them then we place the 40 mm by 100 mm sample for dry pressing by placing the adjacent fabric on it 
We lower the device over the sample and we subject it to testing for 15 seconds. After 15 seconds, we lift the device from the sample and we terminate the dry pressing test. Then we prepare the sample for damp pressing. At this stage, we test the sample in a dry manner, while we test the adjacent fabric in a wet manner. Therefore, we submerge our adjacent fabric into the pure water and we make it absorb as much water as its own weight. We can drain excessive water with a napkin. Then by weighing it with a precision balance, we make sure that it has absorbed as much distilled water as its own weight. And we first put the test sample and then the adjacent fabric over it. Closing the device lid for 15 seconds again, we subject it to the test. Then we lift the device from the sample again and we terminate the test. And finally, we subject both the sample and the adjacent fabric to the test by wetting them for wet pressing. Later, we submerge our cotton fabric under pure water and we make it absorb as much water as its own weight. We can drain excessive water with a napkin. We place the adjacent fabric on the sample. Lowering the device lid over the sample again, we subject it to a test for 15 seconds. At the end of this period of time, the wet pressing test is terminated. The color change in the sample is evaluated in two different ways according to the grayscale, immediately at the end of the test and after conditioning for four hours. The tested sample and the original sample are put side by side and are covered with a mask to determine the hot pressing color fastness. It is evaluated according to the gray scale. The gray scale contains values from 1 to 5. 1 is the worst value whereas 5 is the best value. Then by comparing with the grayscale, the test results are given. While we evaluate the color fastness of the adjacent fabric against the hot pressing, we utilize the staining scale. Again, by placing the cotton fabric in its original state, and the fabric subjected to the test side by side, we cover them with a mask and we compare them with the staining scale. One is the worst value, while five is the best value. The value that corresponds to color change in the sample is given as the test result. Color fastness to ozone 
This method is intended to determine the resistance of the color of all kinds of a textile to the action of ozone in the atmosphere. Fabrics are exposed to ozone in a test chamber at a specified temperature and humidity. Humidity is a definite factor in the rate of color change with ozone. Either of the following two conditions may be used. Ambient room temperature and RH 65%, 40 degree temperature plus minus 4 degree and 85 plus minus 5 degree relative humidity. Rating should not be worse than 4. Other tests can include band amines, ISO, PCP and formaldehyde, print durability, print fastness, embroidery thread fastness, trim fabrics and fabric and trims attached. Soil stain release. A fabric specimen is stained. It is laundered in standard conditions and then compared with scale of 1 is to 5. Water resistance and repellency. Water resistance is an important property of fabric intended for uses such as raincoats, tents, umbrellas. Three ways in which water can pass through. By wetting the fabric followed by a capillary action which brings the water to the other side. By pressure of the water forcing it through the opening of the fabric by a combination of the two actions already mentioned. Water resistance and resistant and waterproof. Water resistance is the ability of a fabric to resist wetting and penetration of water. Resistance to water penetration increases rapidly with increasing weight and thickness of the fabric. Woven fabrics generally have better resistance to water penetration than corresponding knit structures. Waterproof fabric. A waterproof fabric is a fabric that is coated or impregnated to form a continuous wall against the passage of water or a continuous sheet of rubber or plastic. Water repellent fabric. A water repellent fabric is one whose fibers are usually coated with hydrophobic type compounds and whose pores are not filled in the course of treatment. This type of fabric is quite permeable to air and water vapor. Snagging is a defect caused by the pulling or plucking of yarns from a fabric surface. ASTM has two test methods, maze test method and bean test method or for testing snag resistance.
abrasion resistance. The specimen is subjected to a certain number of rubs or revolutions and then one of the following is evaluated. Overall appearance, loss in color or shade, signs of damaged yarns, fibers and so on. Loss in the breaking strength of the specimen, loss in the weight of the specimen, decrease in the thickness of the specimen, change in the air permeability of the specimen. Abrasion or wear is the wearing away of any part of a material by rubbing against another surface. Carpets are often discarded because of extensive wear, trouser and shirts because of fraying cuffs and collars, bone seats and elbows. Abrasion because of friction between cloth and cloth, cloth and external object or very slowly due to friction between fibers and dust or grit. The measurement of abrasion resistance is complex. The resistance to abrasion is affected by many factors. Inherent mechanical properties of the fibers, the dimension of fibers, structure of yarn, construction of fabric and the type, kind and amount of finishing material added. The purpose of fusible interlining is to give shape or form and improve the aesthetics of a garment. The best test is to fuse the interlining with actual fabric and test before the start of the bulk production. Fusible interlinings should be tested on shrinkage, <coughs> drape, strength, strike back, strike through and bubbling. Testing zippers. Zippers can be testing tested using any one or more of the following ASTM test methods. Durability of finish of zippers to dry cleaning, laundering. Durability and finish of zippers to dry cleaning, laundering. Color fastness of zippers to dry cleaning, crocking, light and laundering resistance of zippers to salt spray, measuring zipper dimensions, strength test of zippers, operability of zippers. Zippers strength is usually tested in the following areas, cross wise strength, scoop pull off, holding strength of stops, scoop slippage, resistance to cushioned compression of sliders, slide deflection and recovery, resistance to twist of pull and slider, resistance to pull of slider pull. Testing elastic waistband. There are three properties of elastic waistband need testing. Shrinkage, fit for the labeled size, resistance to degradation, becoming loose, losing elasticity due to laundering. Testing yarns, elongation and strength, yarn number, yarn twist. Sewing threads should be tested on diameter, strength and elongation, shrinkage, twist and twist balance, yarn number. We will now have a recap on module 1 of unit 2. We talked about fabric strength. Under fabric strength, we talked about breaking strength. We talked about tear strength. That is the resistance to tearing or sharing force. We talked about bursting strength, resistance to bursting force. We learned that breaking strength is used for woven fabrics only. And we talked about the method to test the breaking strength. We talked about tearing strength that is done with the help of the instrument element of. Tearing strength refers to resistance to tearing or sharing force. We also talked about bursting strength which is done for knitted fabrics, lightweight woven fabric and the non-woven fabrics. 
we learned that seam strength is done with the help of the instrument in strong and seam failure can occur in a garment because of either failure of sewing thread leaving or the fab uh, or due to fabric rupture we talked about the various elements that affect the seam strength we talked about stitch type stitches per inch thread tension seam type seam efficiency elasticity seam slippage and seam cracking we talked about resistance to yard slippage the test method which is used to determine the resistance to slippage of filling yarns over warp yarns or warp yarns over filling yarns using a standard seam we talked about fabric stretch properties that stretch is required in all apparel products and and used more and required more in sportswear and swimwear we talked about dimensional changes in apparel due to laundering dry cleaning and pressing we talked about shrinkage due to fiber yarn and fabric shrinkage and we talked about how to do the shrink how to test the shrinkage we learned that durable press is the term used to describe fabrics or garments that will retain its original shape and we learned the method to do the durable press we talked about bows bow and skewness or bias and we talked about that filling yarn in woven and coarse in knitted are perpendicular to the selvage in case of deviation we we uh, find skewness and bow and skewness can be reduced during cloth manufacturing dyeing or stentering we talked about pilling as a as a process and pilling is a defect that is characterized characterized by little fiber balls that are clinging to cloth surface and giving a garment unsightly appearance we talked about that pilling depends on various factors like fiber length denier fiber mechanical properties yarn twist level fabric construction fabric finishing treatment and end use of the apparel we talked about the pilling test for which the equipment martindale's tester is used and the photographic standards developed by astm for the measure measurement of the pills we talked about color fastness that color fastness for the for color fastness aatcc has developed three scales that help in visual comparison between the original color and the color change these scales are known as gray scales for color change and staining and chromatic transference scale we talked independently about all these three scales we talked about gray scale for color change uh, this scale consists of nine pairs of standard gray chip chips each pair representing a difference in color or contrast corresponding to numerical fastness rating we talked about assessment of color fastness and staining and we talked about the visual comparison the visually comparing the difference in color or contrast between the untreated and treated specimens we talked about gray scale for staining the scale consists of pairs of normally white and gray color chips each representing a difference in color or contrast the rating from 1 is to 5 where 5 means no difference in color between the original material and the tested piece of it the chromatic transfer scale has 30 color chips the fabric exhibiting the transferred color to be evaluated is placed behind the card on which the chips are mounted so that a representative part of the colored portion is visible through one of the circular holes in the vertical column closest to it in character of shade the standard undyed fabrics used in the color fastness testing are multi fiber and 100% cotton we learned what are multi fiber fabrics 
these fabrics are to check staining or other fabric types multi-fiber adjacent fabric is being used the cotton fabrics are used for evaluating color transfer in crocking and hot pressing we talked about various kinds of color fastness that is color fastness to washing color fastness to dry cleaning color fastness to light etc color fastness to washing for this we use the instrument laundrometer and we learned about the method to do the color fastness to washing the according to the results the rating should not be worse than class 3 or class 4 we talked about color fastness to dry cleaning this test is done in the same way as color fastness to washing except that instead of using soap solution dry cleaning solution is used we learnt about the reasons to use the perchloroethylene in this test we learnt about color fastness to washing the, the instrument for which is fadeometer and weatherometer we learnt about two kind of light sources that is artificial light source and carbon arc we talked about the reference standards and blue wool standards then we talked about color fastness to crocking color fastness to crocking is uh, in this case a color dress specimen fastened to the base of crock meter is rubbed with a white test cloth and assessed by comparison with the AATCC chromatic transference scale or gray scale for staining the color fastness to crocking we check both wet and dry both color fastness are used we talked about color fastness to perspiration wherein we learnt the method to do the color fastness to per perspiration and a test specimen is evaluated for color change and staining on the multi-fiber test fabric with the help of the AATCC gray scale the color fastness to perspiration the test specimen is evaluated for color change and staining on the multi-fiber test fabric with the help of AATCC gray scale the color fastness to abrasion frosting is a change of color in a fabric caused by localized abrasive wear we learned about frosting in detail and the results associated with this we talked about color fastness to heat that is hot pressing this this test method is intended for determining the resistance of color of textiles of all kinds and in the forms to color change and color transfer when subjected to hot pressing we learned that tests are given for hot pressing when a fabric is dry damp and wet the textile and use usually determine which test should be conducted in color fastness to ozone the method is intended to determine the resistance of the color of all kinds of textile to the action of ozone in the atmosphere we learned how to do the test of color fastness to ozone we also test talked about other tests that is band means print durability print fond fastness embroidery thread fastness trim fabrics and trims attached we talked about soil and stain release a fabric specimen is stained it is laundered in standard conditions and then compared with scale of 1 to 5 we talked about water resistance and repellency water resistance is an important property of fabric intended for use such as raincoats tents and umbrellas so we talked about the three ways in which the water can pass through we also talked about waterproof fabrics water resistance and waterproof water repellent fabric waterproof fabric we learned the difference between the two kind of fabric waterproof fabric is a fabric that is coated or impregnated and water repellent fabric are usually coated with hydrophobic type compounds and those pores are not filled in the course of treatment we talked about snagging which is a defect caused by the pulling or plucking of yarns from a fabric surface 
there are two test methods to do this one is the bean test method or testing snag resistance we also talked about abrasion resistant wherein the specimen is subjected to a certain number of rubs or revolutions and then then uh, then overall appearance and breaking strength are evaluated we learned the various uh, various parameters of fusible interlinings that needs to be tested on we learned that shrinkage drape strength strike back strike through and bubbling needs to be tested before using the fusible interlinings we talked about the testing of zippers wherein we need to conduct the we need to measure the zipper dimensions and strength test of zippers and operability in testing zippers the areas where we need to focus on we learnt about those areas we need to talk about crosswise strength scoop pull off holding strength etc then we talked about the testing of elastic waistband wherein we test shrinkage fit for the labor size and resistance to degradation we also talked about the testing of yarns and the parameters that need to be checked we we uh, we learned about the testing of sewing threads where we in where in certain parameters that need to be checked are discussed we now move on to module 2 that is on care labels now the objectives of labeling a product first of all why do we label a product the products are mainly labeled to reflect the brand image or brand name convey care instruction to ultimate consumer let the consumer know the fiber content of the product so that accordingly the customer can take care of the product carry the information about the place of origin of the product this is very important as the customer needs to know where exactly the product has been manufactured in today's time carry the size fitting criteria of that particular product we need to know what kind of size that product is made of so that is why to in order to indicate the size information to the customer we have to label a product we also the products also carry miscellaneous information like product codes fire warnings eco concerned message that needs to be conveyed to the customer and that can be done only through through the labeling the product the relevance of information the information given on the labels should be clear easily understandable and free from any kind of technical jargon so that the customer can understand in easy language there are different terminologies which are used for labeling a product basically a piece of woven or printed single or multicolored tape with written information and or picture drawn onto it is known as a label this reflects the manufacturer's image in the product including brand label content label place of origin label care instruction label and size label brand label indicates the brand of the product that is that has manufactured that particular product content label shows the content of the of the uh, materials used in that kind of product in case of garments it is let's say cotton or polyester 60% cotton or 40% polyester etc place of origin label indicates the place where the product has been manufactured care instruction label indicates how do we need to take care of the product in the longer run and size label indicates the size of which the product is made up of 
Now there are different ways of labeling. We have attachment labels. This is a small extra piece of fabric or tape that is attached in different positions on a garment with information written and symbols drawn onto it. We have embossing. The information to be conveyed is embossed on a selected portion of the garment itself. The other way is embroidering. The information and or motif is embroidered on a selected portion of the garment itself. There are miscellaneous ways also like printing on tags, poly bags, etc. The brand or main label is an end fold label or a label with only the brand name written. The size label is a folded label. Gives, it gives the size information. It gives information on the country of origin and it gives trade information. The wash care label gives information such as languages used, what kind of languages, let's say English, French, Spanish, etc. Washing temperature, for example, 40 degrees Celsius. Do not bleach. The fabric does, the garment doesn't need to be bleached. Low tumble dry. Do not dry clean. Canadian standards are used. These are the kind of informations that are provided on wash care label. Now care label. Care labeling gives consumers the instructions for cleaning the soiled garment. It gives consumers the opportunity to make purchase decisions based on the time and resources needed to refurbish the textile item. The, the criteria for care label are, is given, a, it will be discussing about it to design proper and effective care instructions for a product, the following parameters should be studied. Fiber content of the product, pre-processing of the product. Pre-processing of the product means how do we have to process that particular product, the, uh, the, the, uh, the steps involved prior to the processing of the product. Fabric construction and type of the garment, what kind of garment it is and what is the fabric construction. End use of the product. End use of the product indicates how are we going to use the product at the end. Whether are we going to use it as in the, let's say in case of sportswear or whether we are going to use in in the rainy season. So all these factors are interrelated. Care label and international scenario. Care instructions are dependent on product content and product type. Product content is very important here wherein it talks about the, the kind of fabric content it has in case of garments. Let's say 60% polyester, 40% cotton or 60% cotton or 40% polyester. Product type, whether it is whether it is for casual wear, whether it is for formal wear, totally independent of place of origin and place of ultimate use of the product. The care instructions do, uh, are independent of the place or origin and place of ultimate use of the product. Different governing bodies in different countries control the care instructions in their own territory. Basically, the care instructions are the same, only the means and methods of conveying it to the consumer are different in different countries. We have different care label contents. We have different care labels for washing, drying, ironing, bleaching and warning instructions. This care label indicates wash at 40 degrees Celsius, do not use chlorine bleach, do not tumble dry, iron at maximum temperature of 
150 degree Celsius. Dry clean with any solvent except trichloroethylene. This care label indicates wash at 40 degree Celsius, do not bleach, iron at 140 to 160 degree Celsius temperature, dry clean with any solvent except trichloroethylene and hang in shade. There is brand label. The location is at the center back of the garment and the detail reads Forever 21 that is the brand name soon on the back strip that is an attachment label. This is a size label. The location is at center back of the garment attached with the brand label. The details specify the size of garment in US, Canadian, Mexican, Brazilian, European Union, UK, Korean, Japanese and Chinese standards. The back loop indicates the place of manufacturing label. The location is on back loop of tag 2. The details specify the place of manufacture of the garment in English, French, Bulgarian and Spanish. The location is right side seam of the garment. The details specify fabric composition, wash care instructions and place of manufacturing in, in 11 languages English, French, German, Espanol, Korean, Japanese, Chinese, Italian, Dutch, Portuguese, Russian in four labels. Each label being numbered and having the barcode number of the garment. The first label also contains the four wash care symbols in three different systems. 84% rayon, 12% polyester, 4% elastane or spandex. Hand wash cold, do not bleach, dry flat, iron low, iron low, do not dry clean, made in Guatemala. The details specify the information about the various importers in different countries that are Japan, Korea, European Union, Colombo, Mexico, Child, Brazil, Ecuador and El Salvador. The location of this care label is right side seam of the garment. It's specifying the barcode and corresponding number of this particular garment. And also it contains the garment style, registered identification number and CA identification number. The location of this very hang tag is neckline of the garment. The uh, details include attachment label, strip of fabric sewn on the neckline where the sleeve is attached. The label indicates forever 21. Brand label on the center back down the collar. The size label adjacent to the brand label. Both labels are placed at the center back for clear visibility. Next label is wash care labels in different languages are placed by clubbing together at the wearer left side. Next label the brand label down the collar and at the center back. The size label is placed one inch apart from brand label towards the right side of the viewer. The wash care labels, fabric detail labels and all informative labels are placed at the left side seam of wearer with 3.5 inches to 4 inches approximately up from the bottom hem if it's waist length top. 
the item is of kids to boys okay the branded 2500 pieces tank top the fabrication is 100 percent cotton the rn and ca number is as follows this is made for usa the quantity is 2500 pieces the size is indicated the color shade is also there moq is not allowed packing is blister poly with ctn goods location is given price is also given and the payment mode is also given this k label indicates the countries that is syria egypt poland respective importer names written in the respective languages the fabric content information is given as 100 percent cotton 27 languages are used and address is rewritten the manufacturing country information is also given made in bangladesh created and imported 27 languages used and address written sources of standards are there the various sources of standards we discussed in the last units these are the standard making bodies they are aatcc that stands for american association of textile chemist and colorist astm american society for testing and material ansi american national standards institution iso international standard organization bsi british standards institute labeling clothing consumers should be able to find the k labels easily at the time of sale in case of heavy packaging additional care information need to be placed on the outside of the package or hang tags need to be attached k labels need to be securely and permanently attached k labels must be legible during the useful life of the product a garment with two or more parts that is sold as a unit needs only one care label if the care instructions are the same for all parts items which are not labeled include handkerchiefs belts neckties suspenders non woven garments made for one time use we'll now recap we'll now do a recap of the module 2 of unit 1 that is on care labels we studied about the objectives of labeling a product the pro any product is labeled because of because we want to pass on the information to the ultimate consumer regarding the brand name regarding the care to be taken for that particular garment regarding the fiber content regarding the place of origin regarding the size and to convey miscellaneous information like product mm. code or fire warning we talked about the relevance of this information that it needs to be clear and easily understandable for the customer we talk about different terminology of labels which are used in a product we have brand labels we have content labels we have place of origin labels we have care instruction labels and we have size labels we learned about the different ways of labels we can attach the label and we can st uh, we can just stitch the label with the garment we can emboss the label and we can embroider the label on the on the shell fabric of the garment itself and we can have miscellaneous way to pass on the information to the final customer for example printing printing on tags poly bags etc we discussed what is a brand label or a main label wherein the brand name is written we talked that size label indicates the size information of that particular product we talked about wash care labels wherein different languages are used the customer gets to know at what temperature the garment is supposed to be washed and what are the other care instructions that need to be taken care of while the usage of the garment then we came on to care labels 
and we talked about the significance of the care labels where the care label gives consumers the instructions for cleaning the soil garments in order to make the longer ride in, in order to wear it for a longer time. We talked about the criteria of care label wherein we talked about that in order to design a proper and effective care instructions we need to know the fiber content pre-processing of the product, fabric construction and end use of the product. We talked about the care label and the international scenario wherein we discussed that the care instructions are dependent on the product content and product type and the care instructions are totally independent of place of origin and place of ultimate use of the products. The different countries, there are different governing bodies who talk about the care instructions in their own territory. We discussed that the care instructions are basically the same, but the methods and conveying the information to the consumers are different, may be different. We talk about the basic operations involved in caring for textiles and garments. So the basic operations, we categorize them into washing, drying, ironing, bleaching and warning instructions. We discussed many of the care labels on the garments and we discussed the instructions given on these care labels. We talked that washing instructions are given, whether to use chlorine bleach or not is given, whether to use tumble dry or not and so on. <coughs> In label 2, we talked about that, the, that this garment has to be hanged in shade in order to longer its life. We talked about the positioning of the brand label which is normally at the center back of the garment and we talked about the garment having a label of forever 21. We talked about the positioning of the size labels and the details specified by the size label and the place of manufacturing label. We also discussed the location of, the, of another label that is placed at the right side seam of the garment and the details which are specified this particular label. The tag uh, uh, label number 3 also talks about the fabric composition and especially the instructions that need to be taken care of while the usage of the garments. We also get importers information from the care label. We talked about the bar tag and which specifies the bar coding and corresponding number of this particular garment. We talked about hand tags and attachment label strip of where is the strip of fabric is sewn with the label. Then we talked about the brand label on the center back down the collar. We talked about the wash care labels and sometime it is there at the wearer's left side. We saw the pictures of the brand label down the collar and at the center back and the size label is placed one inch apart from brand label towards the and the placement of the size label and brand label. We saw the pictures of the measurements approximately from the hem, the placement of the care label on the garment. We also talked about the information that is gained by the RN number and CA number given on the garment and the various informations that can be taken out from the labels which are placed in a garment. We talked about the various countries involved uh, which are written on the care labels. The fabric content information is also given by the care label. The care labels also give the information about the countries where the products and manufacturing as we discussed earlier. Now uh, we discussed that we discussed various standard making international organization who makes these standards and which are conveyed all across all over the world the standards made by them. We have discussed these standard making bodies 
uh, in uh, detail in our last units or in our unit one of standards that in in, in unit one of the standards I think I, uh, we discussed these standard making bodies in details in our unit one you can refer to unit one for understanding more of these standard making bodies however we will just introduce these standard making bodies who are involved in conveying these standards all across the world these are AATCC that is American Association of Textile Chemist and Colorist American Society for Testing and Material American National Standards Institution International Standard Organization British Standards Units Institute we talked about that why do we need to label the clothing so that the consumer need to need to be able to find the care labels easily so that they can take the information and use the garments accordingly as per the instructions given the care labels need to be securely and permanently attached so that they can withstand the wearer's life and the care labels must be legible during the useful life of the product a garment with two or more parts that is sold as a unit needs only one care label if the care instructions are the same for all parts. We also discussed in brief the items which are not labeled generally and these are handkerchiefs, belts, neckties, suspenders, non-woven garments made for one-time use. Thank you.